Hello and welcome to Sound and Image Lab, the Dolby Institute podcast. This is a show about how artists use technology to help them tell their stories. And I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. Today we're talking about Dune, a fantastic new cinema adaptation from co-writer and director Denis Villeneuve. I got the chance to go over to Warner Brothers Studios recently to watch a preview screening of the film, and it is spectacular. And the next day I got to sit down with the man himself, filmmaker Denis Villeneuve, as well as key members of his post-production sound team, Academy Award winner Mark Mangini, who is the supervising sound editor on the film. He got the Academy Award for Mad Max Fury Road. And we also were able to talk with co-supervising sound editor and sound designer Theo Green and re-recording mixer Ron Bartlett. Now, the last time these three gentlemen worked for Denis Villeneuve, they all got an Academy Award nomination for Blade Runner 2049. So I'd say they set the bar pretty high, and I am happy to report that Dune does not disappoint. It is really a fantastic cinema experience. We talk about quite a few scenes in uh, in a good amount of detail in this conversation. So if you haven't had a chance to see the film yet, I would suggest you leave the house and go to a cinema and get the full-on experience of it if you're able to. And if you're able to see it at a Dolby cinema, I suggest that you do that to experience this film in full-on Dolby Vision and Dolby Atmos because it is a truly spectacular big screen experience. And come on back and listen to how these artists were able to accomplish this amazing work. This was so much fun. It was the first time in over a year and a half that we've been able to sit down in person and have one of these conversations. And it was just a fun, spirited discussion about the creative process and about how they made this film. So uh, I hope that you enjoy this conversation uh, as much as I did because I had a blast talking with these artists about the film. Let's hear what they have to say. Thank you guys so much for taking the time to talk to us uh, on the Dolby Institute podcast today about Dune. So I have to disclose, first of all, I'm a huge fan of the material. Weirdly, I found my way into Dune through David Lynch's film, which came out when I was a teenager. And I think I was just too young to understand that, oh, this movie might have some problems, but I loved it. And then, of course, I found my way to the book after that. And so, you know, being a fan was so excited to see the film absolutely love it so like you've made a you've made a piece that resonates with the fans but also we were there with some of our of our team who don't know the the material at all have never seen any of the previous versions or read the book and they loved it as well so congratulations you made a a really fantastic film that i think audiences are going to respond to but denis i want to start with you you know obviously dune is a classic of the genre obviously has a lot of baggage in terms of a lot of filmmakers have tried to approach this material before their previous versions of it what call to you about Dune? What, why did this resonate with you and why did you want to make this film? When I discovered the book around 13 or 14 years old, I, 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 I was spontaneously, uh, I felt in love with it, about what it was saying about uh, how, this, 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 the journey, the journey of this young man uh, finding comfort and, and make, finally find cons- cons- consolidating a piece of his identity in contact with another culture and 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 uh, being mesmerized by this other culture in the, in the context, the Fremen culture, there was something and about the, the this relationship between the Fremen culture and the desert and the ecosystem and biology. For me, it was like uh, and the cross mix between biology and religion. It was uh, uh, I was a uh, um, student that uh, uh, loved science, uh, I, I, and uh, there was a very specific moment in my life where I had to choose between biology and cinema so it was like so dune for me was like the blend of uh, all my passions and it's a book that stayed through the years uh, uh, i was very excited when i heard that david lynch was uh, bringing it to the screen and uh, i i uh, watched the movie um, i remember being mesmerized very impressed and disappointed at the same time it was like uh, uh, there was elements of it that uh, um, i thought he had Thought it was a total success, and other times I was feeling a kind of discomfort. So I, I came out of the screening with mixed feelings, but uh, um, and I said to myself at the time, 
someone else will uh, bring it to the screen again in the future because there's are elements in it that uh, there's a, a sensation ideas that uh, are not were not in the movie it was too far away from the book and i said no, once someone some one day someone will bring it again and uh, yeah i that kept be it was in the back of my mind of course uh, for years it was a fantasy because uh, 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 I was like an indie filmmaker working in Canada, so it was total out of reach. I mean, <laughs> frankly, it's a bit strange for me today to be with you, gentlemen, and to talk about the fact that we did Dune together. I mean, it's a, it's a bit crazy. I'm still digesting the, the idea, but uh, um, life is strange. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you talk about being an independent filmmaker working in Canada, and obviously, you know, you started on much smaller movies than Dune uh, when you were beginning as a, as a filmmaker. Uh, I heard you say uh, that one of the things that you found really frustrating about uh, being an indie filmmaker was the fact that sound was always at the very end of the process. And it, it was really kind of an add-on that you didn't really get to pay attention to until the end of the film. I know you work very differently now. Uh, can you talk about uh, a bit about, you know, bringing these guys in early, how you engage with sound and music from the very beginning of the process. But the thing is that uh, when you work in the indie world, of course, uh, I'm sure that maybe some people are able to bring the sound earlier, but me, I was always like um, fighting against the system. Uh, it's about, at the end of the day, money. Uh, and, and it's like uh, you you need to pay people, of course. And, and it's like uh, uh, um, I was not able to... Uh, I, f I was always feeling that it was something that was done very quickly at the end. And it was very disappointing, you know, that uh, to listen to your movie uh, six months later and, and it's, I, I wish I had more time. I, I wish I, had, I could have done this sound differently. More importantly, I thought there was no real philosophy behind the sound. Not, not really a lot of thinking, not a, a structure. There was like, a, it was just there to, it was too rushed. Okay? In the, and... Um, so uh, when I started to work uh, here in uh, Los Angeles, uh, the, 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 one of the beauty of the system here is that you have more uh, resources. And, and um, more specifically, the, the first time that I feel that I finally I, I had the feeling that I was working uh, in a, something closer to my dream was on Blade Runner with these gentlemen that uh, came earlier in the process. Uh, uh, Joe Walker... Uh, my editor being, a, 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 he studied as a composer. He became a, a sound editor himself at the BBC. Sound is very important for Joe. And it's one of the reasons why I choose to work with him. It's because it's the, the very, when J Joe cut the movie, he cuts the sound in the same time. There's like, when uh, uh, Mark and Theo comes on board, there's already, uh, we all have already like a kind of direction in the in the sound structure and the sound philosophy. We, we are the sound evolves. So so and for me that dialogue is important with Joe at the beginning and then these gentlemen are brought in very early on to have the time to experiment, to make mistakes. To to uh, it's not at, 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 to, to no it's Many. true. <laughs> say no it's true. It's part of the creative process. It's 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 uh, and 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 um, uh, to suggest things. Sometimes uh, they they are able to. We are lucky; they nail it right away. Sometimes it's a longer. It's normal. Yeah. So it's a, it, it, it's a, it be, I love the way they become like mad lab scientists. That's where that the, and and where the that's where the crazy great idea can be born. And I think that Dune uh, uh, had that the chance to have uh, Tim and Mark coming early on and and starting to explore and providing Joe Walker with with sound as he cut the movie so the cut of the movie will be directly influenced by their work at the right. beginning yeah right i really appreciate that you brought <clears throat> you bring up that joe walker has a uh, background in composition and sound editing uh because i think it just that must make it even so much more rich of a collaboration for you guys he's got such a good ear um he intuitively knows i mean he's he's as, as much a, a a guiding light as denis is when we're having our briefs about what should this movie sound like. And he, um, because of that ear, he's using sound that Theo and I are developing early on and allowing it to inform where he makes his edits even. It's, it's a very symbiotic process in those early stages. 
Well, talk to me about the early stages. Um, I'm, I'm sure that you know you guys. You guys probably started having conversations about this while you were working on Blade Runner. I'm, I'm, I'm sure. So, when, how did you get involved? Like, where, what, how do you start to approach this material? Because obviously, it's Dune. You're not going to be leaning on an existing library for a lot of this material. It has to be really creative. This so. is a world built entirely from scratch, and that, that's the the big challenge. But it, it starts with. Theo, really, it starts with Theo because Theo is embedded with Joe and Denis during filming. And that's one of the, the part of Denis' genius is he recognizes the value, as he was just mentioning, of sound informing his process. And Theo, please. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I suppose in the same way that if uh, an editor is using temp music, it's very hard for a composer to then come in and, and completely ignore what's been laid as a temp. But the same with sound effects, um, especially if you're dealing with sound effects that don't exist in the world that we live in. Um, so a spaceship or a technology like the shields that we see in in um, Dune, it's very important for him to, you know, he can't just reach into a sound library and put a temporary sound effect in there. And if he did, then it would be confusing to us uh, sound editors coming on later. So for him to be able to say, okay, these are the big ticket items. We need to hear what the voice sounds like. We need to hear what a worm sounds like, ornithopter shield. Uh, especially those elements that simply can't be recorded or found in a sound library. That allows him to start developing how those things look in the cut. It also allows him to pass those ideas to the VFX team and they can hear what we're working on and how those things might sound. So it's a collaborative process. And if we came on much later and he'd been using temporary sound effects all the way through, I think we wouldn't have that uh, ability to inform his cut and the work of the VFX artists. And that's something which uh, um, Denis made possible by allowing Joe to bring us on early. That's something which, even on a studio movie, is not a, a common thing. I mean, normally we're post-production, so the idea of starting that budget during production would normally just be refused. Yeah. But creatively, you get a much better product. You, you, yes. I mean, you mentioned that it is, you know, there are, you know, a lot of people, a lot of producers kind of don't want to do that for financial reasons, but I think ultimately it doesn't necessarily have to be a much more expensive approach and you get creatively a much better product. Um, creatively, I, I think it's important, something you said last night, that by embarking on this non-traditional process, by the time you get to final mix, these sounds, I think you called them old friends. Yes, yes, uh, yes. That's yes, yes, a yes. very empowering um, situation for a director because the final mix should be a, a time when Denis can make the big, the meta decisions of, we gotta focus on the dialogue, let's lower the music. And, and that's not the time when the director should be saying, I don't think I like the sound of the ornithopter. I don't like that, that rumbly thing. So this empowers Denis to really be his best at final mix. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's some uh, just, specific sequences that I want to ask you guys about and about how the design uh, of those sequences came together. I, I would love to start with the voice. Um, it's such an important thematic element uh, from the book. Um, and uh, I have a feeling that you're probably going to tell me that this is one of those situations where you did a lot of experimentation uh, and it took a while to kind of dial it in. But can you, Denis, let's start with you. Like, the, the, Obviously, the, the Benny Gesserit voice is a huge element of the film. And what were, what were your instructions to these guys as you were starting to explore what that I, was going to be. The truth is, uh, at the beginning, um, I was like, it, it's a fr frightening one. It's like, it, it's a scent, it's, a cent, it, it's a very, it's at the core of this idea that uh, um, the Bidnish Desirid sisters are able to channel old ancestries. They are able to be in contact with the power of their genetics, those voices from the subconscious that influence our action in the daily business, they can channel them and actually use them for the, the, the better good to be stronger. So they, they, there was this idea of hearing ancient voices. Even when a man used a voice, you will still hear female voices, strong, strong, powerful, mean grandmothers talking. That I love the idea. <laughs> but, the but, 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 but how to approach this, we thought it sounded, that it sounds silly and how to... Uh, to make sure that it will sound um, that to find that balance between the subs and the, honestly, uh, it is teamwork. I mean, um, I, I mean, I was obsessed with this idea of the ancestor's voice, but uh, it's something that, again, as you rightly said, 
needed a lot of experiment from those gentlemen. And, and it was like uh, uh, experiment in, in the editing room a lot. And we did, a thing I love also is that we, we are doing several mixes. It's, there's just not one dub. I mean, there's like, so you, you, we experimented in different, as different stages, uh, different uh, approaches un until there was, there was one where I finally, okay, we got it. But it was not, it was something that took a lot of time. Yeah, and it not it not something that we could add improvise over a weekend. Yeah, there was like it it involved a lot of uh, uh, casting different actresses, the different performances, um, and uh, and a lot of editing and a lot of uh, yeah. It's, I don't know. If, uh, we we all took a an early go at what we thought the voice should sound like and presented various ideas to Denny. And most of those were just treatments of the voice of the actor, um, maybe putting a little reverb on them, maybe putting a little bass on them. And it wasn't until Mark came up with the suggestion that, you know, if we hear maybe an ancient voice and perhaps we hear a multitude of voices, um, then that gives that sense of tapping into some sort of ancestral well of knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and we started recording um, with a voice uh, actor called Gene Gilpin, we experimented with that. The first thing I think we tried was just simply replacing the voice of the actor with another voice. And while that was interesting, it didn't convey the sense of power and you know an explosive force that someone using this voice on you would have. So that's when we started to experiment with a kind of impact, a bass, um, a sub bass layer um, that actually uses a trick that I, I learned from a dub reggae artist called Lee Scratch Perry, uh, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, there's a technique of getting incredibly deep resonant basses where you literally just play the bass sound that you have as a source through a large subwoofer in a room and record that space. And you hear perhaps little rattles and you hear the space being affected. This, is what, this is what Walter Murch used to refer to as worldizing, it is. right? It's yeah. worldizing, yeah. but yeah. in you know, with a subwoofer rather than with a full range speaker. Um, and that became a very important element, but it wasn't until later in the process that when Denis had been experimenting with Joe Walker in the editing room that they came up with the idea of slipping the sink of that um, sub bass element so that it could convey how proficient a user of the voice is so that when Paul is learning to use it, it's not quite in sync and he doesn't quite have the effect uh, that, he, that he wants and, until he finally gets it later on and it's perfectly in sync and it, it feels very powerful and weaponized. And that was something that really came in just in the final weeks. And yeah, yeah, I remember I brought uh, the, the idea to Joe and uh, he tried it. And I knew I uh, looking at his face that it, it was a like, whoa. <laughs> no, no, it, it, it's... Uh, but we looked at each other when we first yeah, saw yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, Of course, there's a huge element of that, which is designed by Ron Bartlett and Doug Hempel, who are working in the mix, both pulling away elements so that it feels as if the room and its atmosphere have being sucked out. I wanted to ask you about that because I, I noticed that last night and I, I mentioned this to you when, before we were, were talking. I felt like, uh, especially that first breakfast scene when Paul is is, is learning experiment. And I, I love the way you use dynamic range uh, in this film. And I felt almost like uh, part of the design for the for the voice is that it, it takes all the sound away before the voice comes back. So there's that beautiful moment when really everything kind of falls away right before Paul uses the voice for the first time. It's a beautiful trick when done subtly and you can't tell that it's happening because you really don't want to say, oh, they're doing this. You know, you don't want to pull out all the sound. So you do it very subtly, like certain elements start to drop away. You still hear the wind chime, but maybe the air is coming down. You're like, you sense something unnerving is going to happen or you don't know what. And then by the time you get there, it's like only that sound hits you. And that low end starts, as we discussed, like moving it out of sync. Uh, and so you're like, wow, what's that? And he's like, you feel that he's conjuring something. And then there was all about layering of what sounds where, like, okay, does the, the gene voice come in right away or does it start with Paul and go into her? So we experimented a lot with that of, of exactly who's coming in where, how much of each attack of each syllable is which character. So it's many layers, obviously, but uh, it's all about when and where, and it's all within a very short time. Right. So it's extremely touchy. Like you move one thing, you're like, ah, it's ruined. You know, we'd start again, and you're like, no, that's not it. So it, you're right. It was a ton of experimenting. 
And the thing is that once we nailed it in that most, and you feel it and, and you know that you have like that kind of uh, impact, that kind of physical experience that we were looking for and, and that is totally connected with the meaning of the voice in the book, then my fear was, but what about if someone listened to it on a, on a, on a very low-tech device, you know? And uh, that's where uh, Ron's genius and, and Doug's uh, and Bill, uh, came, the, the, how to make sure that this will also make sense in the low-tech uh, environment. And that was the challenge. That was my fear that we will lose the effect. Uh, yeah. But you, you succeed. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I want to ask you about that because, you know, obviously I, I just had the experience of, of seeing the film here uh, on a, in, a, in a big room at Warner Brothers and Dolby Atmos, and it's, it's such a spectacular mix. But obviously, you know, not, not everyone is going to have access to that experience. So what, how do you approach designing the sound for the film, uh, understanding that some people are going to hear it on, you know, air buds on a phone uh, and try to make it. Obviously, I know it's. Uh, <laughs> you just killed him right there. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. Well, but uh, to, uh, you want to make that as experience as good as it can possibly be. So how do you approach that? Yeah, that's the challenge is we do a lot of different formats, you know, versioning like, you know, obviously foreign mixes, but also home theater and and two track if it's what we call a low row now it's just left only right only so when you're coming down to that it's like you don't get surrounds you don't get overheads you don't get subwoofers it's left and right <laughs> now you're stuck you're like okay how do we make that deep of a sound come across on your headphones or your laptop or anything like that so uh, it took a lot of experimenting, but I think I've, I hopefully found a little sweet spot there for it to read properly and come through. Uh, I had to high pass taking out all the low end that's too deep that wouldn't even play on your headphones or your home theater uh, and take that out to gain more headroom. So otherwise it eats up all of you and you, your limiters are hitting it and it just goes away. It just folds. So if you take that out, raise up that element louder and then i used a couple plugins to raise that fundamental of the low end up higher so it's a higher note and that would translate into your headphones or your laptop so it's a combination of three or four tricks to get that to play but it took a little while it was not just oh we'll just hit this button and off you go well that's one of the things that i'm sorry go ahead no no me. but that brings a question to me so what do you do do you mix for atmos or do you mix for 7.1 or 5.1? There's different philosophy, but me, I, I feel that the, the, the experience, once I discovered the Atmos system, uh, uh, that was it for me. That was the, the format the, 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 that I, I wanted to embrace. And that's the way we work and we create the movie in Atmos at first, and then we make the declination. Uh, the declination. Uh, is it the right mm -hmm. word, sorry? Uh, but it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a choice. I mean, uh, but the best way to to embrace the sound of this movie is by far in, in Dolby Atmos. It's like uh, it becomes a, almost a physical, I will say, almost a spiritual experience when you experience. There's moments in the movie that uh, are uh, like a close to a yeah physical spiritual experience that I feel it's uh, you cannot have if you listen to it, listen to the movie in your iPad with headphones, it, it, you will not have that experience. For <laughs> I also want it to be noted that I did not pay Denis to say nice things about Dolby Atmos. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was not. No, 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 no. Well, I remember no, no. the first time we talked about surrounds, and you know, it wasn't even Atmos right away. It was even just you know seven one five one, and you were worried that like, I don't like sounds coming out of there distracting me. Mm -hmm. The story's up here, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's true. Like, we felt the same way, and so we said, look, you know, we don't do that. But we do give you a, a very immersive feeling of, you know, atmospheric things and other elements to create that. And then uh, as we got to Atmos and we played it for him, I think that's what sold it. Yeah, it's, it's like it's just that it's a very delicate tool. It's right. a very powerful, but if you misuse it, I think it can be become very gadgety and very distracting. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. at the end of the day, you're not mixing sound, you're mixing an image. You have, you are, it's storytelling and uh, everything that pulls you away from the screen is bad for me. But when sound, the sound of Atmos, what I, I like is that I just have the impression that I'm diving into the image and that uh, it creates an, uh, so that's what I will say. I'm not 
paid by Dolby. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just a filmmaker, or I'd say there are some cameras or some sound that that, that comes uh, the technology. Uh, the, yeah. Well, I I, no, I I appreciate that. I love that because I I I've wanted to ask filmmakers before, especially because I've heard that you know sense of like 5.1 and sort of like putting a door opening in the surround. I deeply hate that. Honestly, yeah. it's like that when when and when I'm in a theater and I hear, and then I'm like, come on. I mean, it's like it pulls me out of the movie. It's not fun. I don't like things that distract are distracting me from the screen. The the it's at the end of the day, the sun is there to push you in the image, not to. Yeah, that's the way I see it. Huh? Yeah, yeah. I think this may be an opportunity to mention Doug Hemphill, uh, Ron's partner yeah. in the mix, who was vital and instrumental in achieving something that Denis could be very happy with, Doug being primarily responsible for sound effects and atmospheres and background things. Um, Doug is a genius at um, engulfing or encompassing the audience or maybe making the audience feel immersed in the movie without distracting them from that. And that's that's a gifted touch that it's very few very mixers delicate. have. delicate. Well, yeah, for me, the, the, it's like sur surgeons. I mean, it's like very delicate balance. It's not, uh, for me, it's not about the Atmos. The Atmos is, for me, is not powerful uh, uh, for the scope of it. It's uh, about the intimacy that it creates with the, the image. No, absolutely. And and I, I'm thinking about, you can start to do things like that, even at the beginning of the film, when you have that beautiful shot and, and you talk about the, the sunlight when it gets low and you can see the spice and you can just hear it a little bit in the overheads and sort of like it it puts you in the space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the mastery of Doug, how he just delicately got that to flow and just it's a feeling that washes over you. Right. Uh, and it's it's such a nice way that he does that and, you know, beautiful textures. It's, it's like, and with that, it's those systems, it's like the, the sound becomes uh, three-dimensional, but it's not something that, uh, it's again, it's something that brings the image uh, to you, not, not uh, the opposite. Yeah. Sorry, I repeat myself. No, that's yeah. good. Atmos yeah. is a tool that's easily abused because of its extended dynamic range and frequency response. The you might presume that well we should use all of that, but the par, again part of the genius of Doug Hempel is that he's more of a reductionist yes, than yes, anything yes, else, yes, right? Yes, yes, and yes, you yes. can comment on this. Doug's first comment might often be, "Let's pull something out of this mix." He's Spartan. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's like very purist, and and you use focused. And, yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, this actually is a great lead into one of my favorite scenes to talk about from a sound standpoint, and it's the it's the I guess confrontation or conversation between the Reverend Mother and Baron Harkonnen uh, on Giddy Prime. I, from a sound perspective, it's so simple what you guys did, but it's so powerful. Can you talk a little bit about that sequence and and what's happening acoustically in it? The thing is that uh, I will just start by describing the sequence for the audience is the, the idea that in Dune, the, the, it's a very paranoid environment. So there are spies everywhere and, and even the, the kings or the, the, the leaders are always paranoid about their own families. So they have a device that uh, they call it a cone of silence, which is a device that protects that, that when you go in a specific space in the room, you know that you'll be safe and nobody will uh, be able to listen to you and you can... Uh, turn on this this device, uh, uh, and that's where we. That's what we. Mean. Yeah, that that's a very fun sequence that uh, took a little experimenting as well. But I really loved how it came out because it it reminded me. I I meditated in a temple one time that was in a circle like this, and if you said something very quietly to your right or left, it would whip around the room, and the other person could hear the whisper in your ear if you were sitting right there. So I kept thinking of that, like, what would make me feel that in this environment? Because they're basically controlled, like, okay, only we can hear this. So everything they say, everyone's going to hear it all over you. So I tried to make it oppressive in a way where it was very claustrophobic, you know, but obviously you're in a big theater. So I achieved it by doing a lot of delays and, and tight reverb and things like that, but that was the feeling I wanted to get was sitting in that temple and hearing that go all the way around you like that. Yeah. It's a remarkably effective sequence. And again, fantastic use of dynamic range, you know? Yeah. It goes from like dead quiet to like, wow, oh, you can hear every little syllable. <laughs> One of the things I noticed uh, hearing it back the other night was another beautiful thing that you did that very few dialogue mixers do. And that is when we're tight on the Baron, Ron is pushing chest frequencies and we feel close and we feel that 
chest resonance of a very large person, but we're in a medium shot or a wide shot, you're playing with EQs and we're feeling that in every single uh, viewpoint of the Baron. And that, that, that's, that's a beautiful technique. People laugh at me when they see my EQ going by. They're like, what is going on there? Because it's always doing this stuff. And it's like a waterfall, you know. But I just love to play perspective but keep intelligibility. That's my number one goal is everyone hear every word in the movie. Uh, but by doing that, you can really play with perspective and, and uh, power with people. Like some actors are going to be the dominant character and you want them, you know, full and big. Uh, even if it's Reverend Mother and, and not just the Baron is the obvious choice, right? Uh, so playing with that, like when Paul's in the tent with his mom and when he really comes alive, you hear it and you're just in a little tent, you know? So it's always playing that perspective with character development in mind. Tell me about the design, the the sound design for the, the ornithopters. <laughs> that was... Um... A mono single effect. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I didn't have it in stereo. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> that, that in our first sound brief, um, Denis presented. You know our challenges. They were fairly obvious. The big ticket items: the worm, the voice, the ornithopters, uh, shields, things like that. And um, Theo and I began to maybe parse who's gonna, who was going to be responsible for what. And somehow, ornithopters fell to me. <laughs> And I was terrified because these it's 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 an unknown method of transportation and it uses wings and we don't even know what the propulsion is. I don't know if there's a battery or a motor or a couple of bugs in a box in there. I'm not quite yeah. sure what it was. But we we as Denis described, Theo and I embarked on a, a very extensive experimentation process of trying to find the individual elements. What could we make wings out of? What could we make? propulsion sounds out of. Um, and it started actually during Theo's work in, during production, during filming, Theo recorded a, a beat, some beetle wing flaps, right? That was our first presentation of something organic because we knew what we didn't want it to sound like. It sh we didn't want it to sound like a helicopter or anything that we were familiar with terrestrially. So there were a lot of things not to do. So we thought, it looks bug-like. It kind of looks like a dragonfly, maybe. And Theo started those experiments and researching, you know, you were going to ship in, like, frozen bugs or something. Oh, it was these <laughs> Hungarian bugs that were in, I don't know if you remember, these things called poloshkas that they get, like, seasonal waves of these bugs. And um, other people in the studio were just kind of destroying them. And I, <laughs> I saved one and recorded it. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, bug wings, sure. But we also... I think as a director from Denis, it's not to get too fantastical, not to get too, you know, we don't necessarily want it to feel like a, like a, like a creature. It's got to have the presence of a military craft. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 to contradict a bit of what Mark is saying is that it's true. Everything you said, uh, but in the same time, I wanted them to look, to sound familiar in a way, not like, not like an helicopter, but something that will not distract something that will just feel like natural to this thing which is like a technically a machine a powerful machine that is flapping in the air <laughs> so it was air movement and i will let you go go on on the recipe because me i love the way they did it but well <laughs> that's that's an important maybe footnote uh, because that was part of denis brief in terms of the the sound of the entire film everything should sound natural um, we wanted anything that we created to feel as though if you were actually there, that's exactly what it might sound like. You, you, it was a believable universe of science fiction. And th that was always an overarching driver to the, the experiments that we would make. Where we would end up would be um, the wing flaps being made from uh, Theo's um, beetle wings processed and cat purring, uh, very, very close mic cat purring, so you get that <laughs> kind of... Uh, fluttering sound because that mimicked visually what we were seeing and then uh, layered again with the sound of a, um, a canvas strap from a tent um, strung in a 140 mile an hour storm so that you'd hear the flapping, the rapid flapping of a very organic piece of material that, that you could envisage as that maybe that's the sound of a wing. We would layer those sounds and then um, use 
processing tools to create the Doppler shift for pass-bys and ins and aways and constants while they're in the air. And then um, engine sounds were made almost entirely of bugs, mostly of bees, beehives, process to add some of that flutter to it. The engine is modulating along with the wings, so we would flutter at the same rate that the wings would flutter at. And the mechanics made from mundane things, real things like the mechanics in my Chevy Volt, just, you know, motors and things that sounded like things you you hear in real life. It's it's uh, I'm very proud of the sound of the Arnitopter, what they came and it came, of course, it was experimental. Sometimes they were it was coming, and I was I was saying, guys, it's it sounds great, but it's too interesting. It's too too exotic. Too it feels too sci-fi in a way. I, 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 when they came back with the, what you hear right now, I feel it's grounded. It's the actual real sound of an ornithopter. <laughs> I feel it like it's like it was something that it came through a process. But I think that that that, that crazy recipe is a total success. I'm really uh, it's it's exactly what the and in the same time it's it's not distracting. It's powerful, but it's not it's something that is linked to the nature of the vehicle. Yeah. One of the reasons for that is that every component of it is acoustic. And, and, and that follows in you, I think, your philosophy. We, we've talked a lot about mm. this. Your maybe aversion to synthesized sound. Mm. Maybe you want to say something about that, but that was a guiding principle for us. But you also do that with visuals as well. You built big sets. Those ornithopters you built at scale. Mm -hmm. Like there's, you, 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 I feel like you only use CG when you absolutely have to. And it would be a lie to say that there's no, it would be a lie to say that there's not a lot of CG in the movie. There's a, it, it, it's, <laughs> it's a tons of CGI, but, but it's just that uh, I'm old fashioned. You know, it's like, it's just that I need reality to be inspired. And, and, and uh, on the day when we shoot for the light, for the actors, it's uh, old school, but uh, uh, I'm not in, in uh, unfortunately, I can't work in virtual environments. I wish I could. We are far away from the sound right now, but in the same way, it's no, because it's like there's something about the the, the beauty of cinema for me. It's um, when you work with very high-tech technology, like NASA technology almost, and in the same time, very, very old-fashioned theatrical tricks. It's like, uh, and I think that it's the same with sound. I think that sound that are just purely... Uh, coming from uh, virtual environments or things. It's, 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 to go back to nature, it's always where the, the, the strength is. Nature is the strongest ally for filmmakers. And I think that when Mark said, we went in the desert, we got lost in the desert, and, and we, we recorded for, for hours and hours and hours, I was so happy. Because for me, that, that they came back with uh, crazy sound. You know, it's like, for me, it's like, uh, I love the idea that uh, all the sound of the movie has been... Um, designed by the, those gentlemen. I mean, it's, there's nothing from banks or it's just really genuine, original, fresh, new sounds, yeah, as, as it should be, yeah. Well, talk to me about going out in the desert. I think one of the, I, I, I'm really curious about the approach to the sound design of Arrakis and, and we were talking before we came in. I, 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 I gained a new appreciation for the worms uh, in the film. There's that beautiful sequence, obviously, when the worm doesn't attack them and kind of Paul and the worm are regarding each other. And then the worm kind of just dives off. And I, I had a, an, an understanding of the sand on Arrakis that I've never had before, which is like to the worm, it's water, right? Mm. It's, it's the worm is swimming in the sand. How did you approach the, that from a sound perspective? Well, to start with, uh, all of us had heard these amazing recordings that Doug Hemphill had made on sand dunes. Um, I don't know if this is a widely known thing, but sand dunes make a sound of their own. They they groan as they shift and move in the wind, and um, it's a beautiful, deep groaning sound. And to make that, we realized that sand dunes must be resonant bodies themselves, much in the way that a, a drum skin resonates when you touch it. So we knew that we had to go out to the desert and play. <laughs> and uh, we took yeah. we took all types of microphones. We took the type of microphones that you can put underneath the sand. Um, we took regular microphones and protected them as well and put those underneath the sand. We put hydrophones underneath and recorded those resonances from underneath uh, as we hit the sand, as we moved things around in the sand. And we also tried to imagine how does that sand worm actually move through the sand? Is it does it vibrate and the sand particles kind of liquefy as it moves? So we tried all types of things and recorded from above and below. And uh, we realized that, you know, to move, a sandworm has to have 
um, the ability to vibrate. And there are, this is a theme of vibration that runs through um, the shields. We, we learn in the movie that the shields can't be used in the desert because they create a vibration that attracts the worms. Mm. Um, we learn that there's a technology that the Fremen use, a sand thumper that also calls the worms like a lure. So uh, we started to build vibrations in the sand from the real recordings that we'd made out in the desert. But you know the, the, the huge uh, discovery really was just how musical and um, otherworldly the sound of a real sand dune is. It's one of the few things that we could go out and record that matched planet Arrakis. Um, we're just glad that there weren't actually any sandworms on there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's, I, I, needed, I need to do this research, but um, one of the elements we captured there was for the thumper, uh, this um, Fremen device to distract or summon the worms, maybe to bring them somewhere else so that you can go the other direction. And there's this zoological concept that, that um, uh, animals adapt to their environments and vice versa, and environments adapt to the, 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 the creatures that live within them. And I asked the question, which came first, the thumper or the, or the worm voice? Because they're meant to mimic each other. Just as the worm goes gunk, 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 so too does the thumper go thump, thump, thump which came first. So we, we tried to tell a little sonic story with some kind of zoological roots there that one reflected the other or they informed each other over the millennia. Tell me about the development of the sound for the shields. Uh, that, that it's, it's such a great sound and it also works so well with the visuals. I was really intrigued by that. I guess I'm not in the mood today. Mood? Yeah. What's mood to do with it? You fight when the necessity arises, no matter the mood. Now fight! Come on! I have you. I... I'm gonna look down, my lord. You to join me in death. I see you found the mood. <laughs> That's uh, frankly one one sound that uh, our shield will sound like. And then I say, guys, less experiment because I, I have I have I had no frankly no preconceived ideas. There was things like the voice. I had like some cues. Uh, the the ornithopter. I knew what I didn't want. The 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 shield. It was something that I, I needed the the boys to experiment. Mm. And and then voila, I say, I say, uh, and they did. <laughs> <laughs> we started with a, almost a, a sort of soft purring sound. I mean, I know that we were all wanting to avoid the trope of a kind of humming electrical field, um, partly because this shield is something which maybe you only see uh, when someone is trying to penetrate it or wh when it's sort of activated. It's not on humming the whole time, so we wanted something that could respond to movement. The first thing was a kind of a purring sound, and it just, I, I played it to Denis, and I think he was like, yes, this is interesting. You know, we'll, we'll work with this for a while. And I could tell that it hadn't quite, it didn't quite have the impact and, and the bite that it needed. And it wasn't actually until uh, an accident happened within the synthesizer that was processing, uh, using granular synthesis, uh, an organic sound, a kind of a purring sound. Um, and the synthesizer just started to go mad and make a, a kind of swarm of clicks. And instead of throwing it away, I thought we can try that and just I played it to Denny. And I remember hearing him go, that. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah. But that's what I love about Theo having the time mm. to, because I remember when you bring the purr, I was like, that's the right direction, but that's not it yet. And that will add ne we will add never had the time to do that yeah. process if it, we had been just in post production. I'd say he had that's what uh, because I think that the pu the pur idea was kind of genius, but there was something in it that was not um, the, the its identity was not solid yet. There was a, it wasn't dangerous enough. Maybe yeah, yeah, it yeah, didn't, yeah, it didn't yeah, feel yeah. like something that, that could repel a weapon. It wasn't yeah, quite powerful no, no, enough. Yes. But but suddenly when you came with that, say okay, <laughs> but uh, you need the time to. Yeah. But then yeah. Denis also developed a whole other level of what the shield could do in terms of you know, we need to know that you can 
uh, for the story, we need to understand that the shield repels only fast blows. If you right. go cutting through it slowly, you can kill someone. Right. It's um, So we needed to really develop the sound of what it sounds like to try and slice through it. And one of the ways that we drew attention to that was Denis' idea of having a, uh, when we see Paul using it in a training um, with, uh, uh, with Gurney, uh, we hear an alarm go off. And that's something that we'd never thought of. But when that idea was passed to VFX and they started developing like a red flash when, right. when the shield is in danger. Mm -hmm. So it, again, not only was the sound able to um, develop and uh, become enhanced over time, but those ideas go back through editorial with Denis to VFX and the whole concept gets developed as as uh, as a whole imagine the sound design influencing the visual effects that's amazing but the, the, the thing is that when you make a science fiction movie in 2020 you you're dealing with a lot of tropes a lot of cliches a lot of things that there's a lot of guys who went in so to try to find something new is a, it you it takes time in the experiments otherwise uh, you just walks in the other people's footsteps Yeah. So I know we're, we're coming to the end of our time. I do have one more question that I want to want to ask you, and it's about the music for the film. Obviously, a fantastic score by Hans Zimmer. Um, Denis, I would I would I would describe you as a director who's not shy about music, who's not afraid of music. I, I remember watching a Sicario for the first time with that amazing score from Johan Johansson, and just the way you use music is so is so wonderful and so powerful and emotional. Um, I, I feel like the score and the sound design are really integrated in Dune in a way that's just wonderful. So how How did you approach the music? How much coordination was there between the departments? Hans was the first artist I, I uh, approached when I, I, I learned that uh, I will finally uh, try to bring Dune to the screen. And uh, I knew that uh, it will be a very... Um, uh, curiously, I don't... Th th some of my movies, uh, 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 most of my movies, the music is kind of, kind of sparse. It's like, this is by far my most musical movie, and I knew it will be like that. It will be very operatic. It will be full, full <laughs> with the full Zimmer power. It will, it will be. <laughs> say, there was something about uh, having a psychedelic, progressive rock, operatic kind of feeling, you know, and uh, like very progression, like, uh, and uh, uh, so I knew that Hans will be very present, and for that, I but I did, I, I wanted, to, and uh, right away, and he, he brought. This idea himself uh, uh, at the beginning is that we should, everybody should work in concert. We should work. He said, I want to work in concert with the, the sound team. I don't want to do something and then be in confrontation with them. I want to work with them from the start. And, and there was this kind of, a, I think, that dialogue that happened. Uh, at the, uh, so they, they will, uh, we will find an equilibrium. Yeah. That's great. And you, you uh, Theo, you worked closely with Hans's team. Yeah, I'd say we had regular um, contact and sidebars, as we put it, just sending him our progress, especially on sounds where we knew that we would be um, working together on something or where the sound was going to hand off one idea and maybe he could then um, take over with that with the score. The the Gom Jabbar scene, for instance, where there's a lot of painful high-pitched resonances, um, both from us and from him, we kind of hand hand it between us rather than it all clashing together in the mix and there again I think you know Ron has a huge part in making sure that the the music is integrated with the sound I and mean, he's he's mixing the music and um, working with Doug Hempel on the effects mixing and I think you know Ron can answer to how much work he puts into making sure that there are no clashes and that there's that feeling of one handing off to the other yeah it's a real uh, challenge when you have that embarrassment of riches of you've got all this great scores so many elements i had 30 35 stems on most of the cues uh doug uh, you know brings all of their efforts to the table and there's just so many great sounds what which ones do you pick and it's really you know you got to trade off you can't have everybody in the pool all the time or it's just a bunch of mush and that doesn't work Um, again, this is where Atmos helps us a lot is I was pulling a lot of sounds off the, the screen, allowing sound effects to play more of what's going on with the box. And I'm playing more of the feeling and the vibe of what's going on. So, um, that helped a lot. Uh, I do it in, in various layers of where you are in, in the room, 
and depending on what the type of sound is, these guys were pretty bored with me going through every stem going, that should go here, that should go there. They're like, when are you going to be done with this? <laughs> but it's a process that really helped us too. So it allowed us to use the entire room, not just the front speakers, and say, okay, this is what you're going to get. We're enveloping you in this whole experience. And going through all of these layers of Hans's music uh, was really fun and interesting because we would hear all these sounds and they were they were hearing it too for the first time. Um, so Doug and I had to really play with what we would rack focus on. Say, okay, we want you to hear this at this moment. When he puts his hand in, you're going to feel this. And and then uh, Loire comes in, this beautiful vocalist that Hans worked with, that, and she just gives you this unbelievable emotion that just wraps over you. So um, I had her all over the place because it was just so beautiful and powerful. And by the time you ramp up through that scene, it just gets so intense with both you know, music and sound effects. You can't tell which one is which. Yeah. And it just yeah. brings you to that peak of fervent you know, of intensity. So uh, I loved doing all of that. <laughs> Believe me, it's like a kid in a candy store. The, the, the thing is that at the very center of the, of the dune, there's the idea of rhythm. That rhythm that is life, rhythm that is death, and and uh, uh, both gentlemen, if I may, are, have musical background, and they, they, all the movie is constructed about this idea of rhythm. So it's like uh, I will say that the, there was a way that the sound design of the movie, of course, sound designer, but they went into a bit the musical territory in a way with the rhythm, you know, and Hans trying to find new ways to express himself wanted to have the permission to go in the sound design also in a bit. It's, it's, yeah, I, I would love to bring sometimes element of the music that we won't know if it's musical and he had to ask, to ask the permission to, to, to play. Of course, he did the music, did the sound design, but still there were dancing on the edges so sometimes. So it, and it, for me, it was fascinating to see that equilibrium, that, uh, that dance between sound and, and music. Yeah. This is part of Denis' genius in going back to this starting sound early because we can begin that dance very early and even in pre-production. Hans was on that early so that by the final mix, a lot of those dances were, 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 had already been kind of meditated on. But you can't do this when the sound and the music show up just in post or just in the final mix. It's, it, it, as you know, it's a nightmare it's, 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 it's a train it's wreck. Just a struggle. It's a train wreck. You make harsh choices that you, yeah. you know, you're suffering on both sides, really. And this is the only way to really you know, make them cohesive and play together. Uh, I mean, you're looking at all of us are all musicians. We've all played, recorded, composed, and Joe as well. Sure. So uh, everyone's speaking on it. And Doug, and great Doug. guitarist. Yeah, I'm, the only one who, Doug I'm the only one who doesn't understand music. <laughs> I failed my... Uh, <laughs> You're the only one who wasn't in a rock band. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, unfortunately, I'm so sad, but uh, I, I'm very bad with music. Yeah, I deeply love music, but I'm... Uh, Guys, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. Uh, I really appreciate you spending the time to do this deep dive with us on the, uh, the sound design of Dune. And also, I just want to acknowledge uh, I, how thrilled I was to see you guys got a main title credit on on this film. Thank you. I know that <laughs> no, that is not an easy thing to get, and I you I'm sure you had to fight for that. And yeah, but the, the thing is that uh, again, sound is at the heart of the cinematic experience. You know, and and uh, so no, that's that's natural. Yeah, I'm a. Uh, yeah, I was lucky to work with masters. What up? Well, speaking on behalf that. of the community, we appreciate you doing that. And uh, uh, again, thank you for spending the time. This is a fantastic film, just remarkable. And how long do I have to wait for part two? That uh, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully people will go in theaters and uh, then we will have uh, an answer. Uh, yeah. Hopefully we will be able to jump soon. Hopefully. All right. Well, uh, I can't wait. Uh, thanks again for both the film and for a, a really fun conversation around it. Thank you. Thank thanks. You. Well, thanks once again to Denis, Mark, Ron, and Theo for taking the time to talk with us about their creative process and the extraordinary work that went into Dune. If you like this conversation, we're gonna be doing many more of these in the coming months, deep dive conversations with filmmakers about their creative process. So please subscribe to us, the Dolby Institute podcast. You can find links to our dedicated show feed in the show notes or by searching for Dolby wherever you get your podcasts. 
We'll see you again shortly for an amazing milestone, our 100th episode. I'm so looking forward to this. We're cooking up something very special for you that I think you'll really enjoy. I also want to acknowledge and thank our friends at Warner Brothers today for inviting us to the screening, uh, for helping us put this conversation together. It was a real joy to talk about Dune. You can and should see Dune as soon as you can if you haven't already. It's available in the United States as of October 22nd, both in the theaters and streaming on HBO Max. And if you get a chance to see it in a Dolby Cinema, as I said in the intro, you will not be disappointed. It is a truly transportive, immersive experience and a movie that should be seen on the big screen if you're able to, because it looks and sounds just amazing. If you're new to the show or already a fan of our show, please consider leaving us a rating or a review. It really helps raise awareness of the show and helps us continue to grow. Until then, thanks again for joining us. This has been Sound and Image Lab, the Dolby Institute podcast. I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. Our producer and editor is Michael Coleman. Our executive producers are Amanda Schneider and Jack Ferry, with production support by Taylor Hines. And our production coordinator is Sonny Chen. Thank you for listening.